I guess I just wanted to start by introducing Lara and myself and it, it kind of struck me this morning as I was sitting there whether how many of, of the people sitting in the audience actually know what people like Lara and I do on a day-to-day -day basis because I think sometimes you just sort of think that we're some people who sit in a university somewhere and come to a conference once a year and I don't know what you think we do in the meantime but <laughs> <laughs> perhaps it's best not to ask that question yeah, really. <laughs> I agree. Um, but I guess Lara and I are both registered nurses. We've worked together for a very long time since we were both I don't know. PhD yeah, PhD candidates. Yeah, PhD candidates a long time ago now. Mm. Um, but currently we're both employed in schools of nursing. And I feel very passionate about that because I do a lot of work with people employed in departments of general practice, but we both certainly work in schools of nursing. <laughs> Essentially, we both lead our own separate programs of research. And as part of these programs of research, we work really closely with a, a range of multidisciplinary colleagues. So we work with GPs. I'm doing some work at the moment with some dietitians and physios and a whole lot of different allied health people. We also do a lot of supervision of research students, and I think you've seen some of the excellent work some of our students have been doing over the last couple of hours. And also the other thing we do is we work really closely with clinical nurses and clinical um, health professionals in our local areas to be developing programs. And Zach indicated some of the stuff that Leah is doing, certainly in the clinic at um, Tamworth. Tamworth. <laughs> and we're certainly doing some similar things with some of the um, nurses who work in the PHN type area in the Illawarra. So I guess today what we wanted to do was really share some key tips and considerations around building evidence for nursing. And I guess it's really important to be able to work with, um, with clinical nurses to be doing this kind of research because it's that way we're, we're building the evidence together. Okay, so we're here to... Thank you, Liz, for telling people what we do. <laughs> um, we're here to talk about research today and I think it's, it's really important to note that and I'm sure you all know that the primary healthcare space is growing. Um, our most recent national data has indicated that we've got more than over 2,000 new community healthcare nurses working in primary healthcare in the last couple of years. And we know that the reason why it is expanding, and certainly um, it's been mentioned in the previous presentations, we've got the increase of chronic illness and so forth. However, it's also really important to note that despite the area growing, it's because of changing health healthcare needs, not because we've got a really strong evidence-based background, uh, evidence-based practice. Um, so it's really important to develop that. Do you, did you want to add anything to that? No? No? Good eye, right. Oh, so <laughs> yeah. The only thing I'd just like to say is that I think the, the second, uh, third point's a really important thing that there's a whole lot of work being done by our health professionals and general practitioners in the yeah. space of building evidence. So we've got dietitians out there who are doing studies to show the value of dietetics in general practice. If we don't go out there and provide evidence of what nursing does, very mm. soon there's going to be lots of dietitians and not very many nurses. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do love the dietetics colleagues greatly, but yeah. They're not nurses. And they don't have <laughs> <laughs> they don't have cake. No cake. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we've put this slide in here and I, I was reading something very interesting the other day around ways of knowing and I'll add to that in a minute. But um, these are all our ways of knowings and it's certainly represented in the nursing literature. But tradition, we're, we do things because we've always done it the same way, which as we know, sometimes isn't as effective. We do things, and this happens with our students quite a lot, being told by nurses that are um, practicing something that may not be the right way to do it, but they're telling them how to do things, okay? And, you know, as students, which if you've worked with students, you would know they take what we say as quite gospel. Um, hum <laughs> uh, human experience, because we've learnt something that we've done by experience. Logical reasoning, which is self-evident. We've thought about it. We've made a gone through a decision-making process. Uh, trial and error, which isn't really appropriate for use in the healthcare service, particularly when we're looking after patients. And research. Now, what I was reading, I was reading an article, I think it was um, only, only from a couple of years ago, and it was looking at, the focus of the article was looking at um, nurses' knowledge and why they do things. But the majority of studies indicated that we practice by our tradition, not by research. And because we are the largest health workforce, 
and makes us in a very prime position to translate our evidence into practice. However, traditionally we haven't done that well, particularly when it takes 15 to 20 years to actually change our practice, which is really bad. Now, the more I look at this quote, the more I seem to really, really like it because it seems, you know, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results, it made me really reflect because I do this every day. Like, you know, I go on a diet or go to the gym to lose weight. I don't lose weight because I'm eating too many biscuits. Mm -hmm. And as we know, it's really actually hard to change behaviours and particularly in the research space as well, and translating our evidence into practice. Jump in if you want to say anything. <laughs> um, so let's talk about the evidence. So uh, evidence generation, uh, generation, generation, yeah. Um, there's so many different ways to do research projects, uh, particularly in a student context that I'll refer to again, yeah, when students come to us, and I'm sure Liz would support what I'm about to say, is students are very scared about research. They don't know what it entails, and a lot of practitioners don't know. I w I've got a joint appointment with the health service, and the people I talk to, it's like, well, yes, I want to do something, but the process seems quite daunting because they don't know how to start it. Okay? So research can be from really, really small qualitative exploratory studies, which is something like, uh, Zach spoke to you about previously, or they can be really, really large studies, okay? But we all need to start somewhere. We need to, when we talk about evidence translation, so putting these research findings, um, particularly if they're, they're good ones, and we'll talk about some evidence later, um, it needs to be accessible to, accessible to clinicians, and it also needs to be accessible to consumers as well. Um, and I've recently done a community health project that was focused on indigenous, an Indigenous population and um, promoting a, a healthier lifestyle. And how we got the community involved in that is we developed and translated that evidence is we developed a healthy recipe book that was, well, it was done in partnership with the community as well. Okay, so... And it, it doesn't have to be, you know, really big research reports. You need to find creative ways. Um, <clears throat> now, and this is evidence utilisation. I think this is something that the healthcare service has struggled with for a long time. And I think we actually need to do that a lot better. Um, and I think something that I've learned is the research has to be supported at all levels. It has to be supported at the ground level with your consumers with all the nurses, with the GPs, and all the managers as well. If you don't have that support to start with and that co collaboration, I think, and I know this by experience, a lot of the time it can fall down. Do you want to add anything? No? I'll pass over to you, Liz. <laughs> so I just wanted to have a quick chat now about evidence generation. So evidence generation is just a fancy way of saying actually collecting new knowledge and new new evidence to support something. Now, I think there's, there's a couple of key things to think about before you start going out and collecting some data about something. And the first point is just that sometimes the data actually exists. So sometimes someone has done something and already published it and put it out there, so you don't actually need to go and collect data because we kind of have a sense of what's happening in that space. So a good example about that is around... Um, there was some discussion earlier this morning around APNA and, and engaging with consumers to find out what consumers think of nurses in general practice. Well, there's actually a reasonably large body of literature. It's a little bit old now, but it's a large body of literature sitting there saying where we've surveyed, we've interviewed and we've surveyed and interviewed nurses in Australia and New Zealand around what they think about nurses who work in primary care. So there's certainly a lot of information in that work that already exists that can be used to inform the things that APNA are wanting to do in terms of developing a new project. So certainly looking at what's there is really important to make sure you've got that really well sorted out before you start. The other thing is, and Catherine alluded to this a little bit earlier in her talk, was that there's, there's multiple ways that you can be involved in research. So you can be a researcher, so you can be going out and running a project and, and collecting your own data and doing your own thing, but 
Equally as importantly, you can be working as a research assistant with a, with a team and, and working on a project, and that's a really great way often to get experience. I know as a, um, as a young academic, I um, worked on an MRSA project, and I now know far more about MRSA than I ever wanted to know in my entire life, and I don't ever want to read a paper about MRSA or falls ever again. But it certainly taught me a, a lot of things that I still um, use today. And the other way that you can engage in research generation or evidence generation that's really, really important is to participate in research. Now, what Catherine neglected to tell you in her study was how long and how many hours she spent knocking on doors, <laughs> ringing practice nurses. I don't think she actually got to the point of offering them chocolate. I found chocolate works really well for nurses. Um, maybe we're up to wine. <laughs> um, but certainly... Being available and, and being engaging and, and, you know, I know that not every nurse can, can put their hand up to be in every research project. I totally understand. You're totally swamped. You've got so many things on your plate. But it's really important that people take the time to be involved because none of us can do any of this work if people don't participate <laughs> or if people don't facilitate that contribution. So that's a really important step as well. So even though they're quite different roles, they're all really important to the whole process. So... I guess Larry and I had some conversations and we just wanted to offer it... Oh, oh, hopefully not a conclusion just yet. Mm, that was this button that I shouldn't press. No. <laughs> he said if it went black, I would have pressed this button, but apparently that I didn't. Uh, pick the academic who should be able to use PowerPoint. <laughs> Clearly, I don't do a lot of teaching. <laughs> There's a reason for that. <laughs> Let's just try the arrow. OK, <laughs> so Leah and I had some conversations, and these were some of the tips we had. I'd, I'd encourage people, if you've got questions, to maybe ask them as we go. Yeah, so, so the first tip was really about engage with people to, to complement your strengths and your weaknesses. Now, everyone in this room has a completely different skill set. Clearly, PowerPoint's not my thing. <laughs> so... <laughs> So I need to find Robbie, who's much better at tech than I am. <laughs> um, research is rarely something you do on your own. And if you do research on your own in your own office mm -hmm. and don't open the door and talk to anyone, it's a really, really boring thing to do. So the best research comes from a group of people who've got complementary skills and can work with each other and can learn from each other to build a really comprehensive project. So if you've got an idea for some research, talk to people. Right? I'm sure there's a heap of people at this conference from a range of different universities or from, from different PHNs or from different practices who have got ideas that might be able to either add to your ideas or help you to develop them even further. And, but before you sort of find your new buddy and, and say that you're going to go and do this project with them and you, you're sort of stuck with them for the next bit of time, take time to check out these people before you sort of mm. sign them on to the team. Yeah, um, <laughs> definitely, definitely. I, Leah and I have certainly um, <laughs> over the years had some experiences of, of working with people who we thought were really good at the time and <laughs> only to find out later that perhaps that was <laughs> not, our, not our wisest collaboration. <laughs> so uh, what are you lot chuckling about? <laughs> <laughs> so I'd really strongly encourage you to like, talk to other people but find out what, what these collaborators are like before you, you certainly um, link up yeah. with them. We learnt the hard way. No, don't recommend that. No, don't do that again. <laughs> Can I ask, how would you recommend doing that with people that you like? So you're not just going out being like, is this person crazy? Like, what's the deal? Look, I, just, just to give you an example, when, when someone comes up to me and asks me to supervise them as a research student, the first, like I talk to them, I, ha I have some conversations with them, the next thing I do is I give them one of my students' phone numbers or email address and I say to them, go and chat to whoever and ask them what they think, like, and I'm not saying that they have to give you their opinion of me, they think what they like, but they certainly tell you what it's like to work with me. So ask people about, I mean, have you done a research project before? <laughs> have you published a paper? Have you got a grant? Have you worked on other things? So be up front and, and, and do ask some questions. Yeah, and you know, I think you, the first place I would start if I was going to work with another researcher is to look at their research profile. That's the first thing I would do. Mm. And you can gauge a lot of information for it. Like, are they publishing frequently? Are they going to be useful for me? But mm, that's what I, with researchers, that's what I do. Yeah. Yeah. You do. Yeah. Yes. And I guess, and I guess, so. Yeah. 
and in that, in that sense, I, I, would off, I often sort of say to people, well, this is how many students I've currently got, this is how many students have graduated in the last five years, because I've got colleagues who are lovely people and work really hard and supervise a lot of students, but none of them ever actually finish. Mm. So it, it, do ask the question. So, I mean, you, you guys looked at look, Cara this morning, getting that new grad award. Cara has been working with us for two, three, <laughs> three years. Um, but had absolutely no publications, no idea and anything, and it was a matter of working with us. So certainly, I mean, we not. It's, it's fine to come with an idea and not have any experience, but I guess partner with someone who does have that experience. Yeah, I think I, I can add to that because I've got, um, I mentor a number of clinicians in, in my space at the moment and um, they've never done any research. So I don't do the research for them at all. I facilitate them to do it. So we have those mentor programs. Yeah. When I, sorry, just one, so when I started at the University of Wollongong, there were these two nurses and they, were, they, they came to me and said, oh, we're two old nurses in the, uh, who work for the, at that time they worked for the PHN, and they said, we want to do some research, but we don't know anything about it. Can you help us? Mm. And, okay. So they, they, they both went off and they were doing a master's at the time, so they had to do a research proposal for their master's. So they spent all this time working with me and they developed this, this master's proposal and then they got to the end of it, they'd got their master's and they went, well, we spent all this time doing this proposal, can we just do it? And I went, oh, okay. So <laughs> we helped them do that. Three publications now they're up to. <laughs> Because um, each time they come back and go like, oh, we just got this new idea. And they had, you know, they weren't um, university trained, they were both hospital trained nurses, had no idea about research, but have, have sort of come, come to us with ideas, have had discussions and worked through it and are now really flying. Oh, Jim, I wanted to ask the avenues for I think partnerships, yep. and that's a part of my role, having the, the, the clinical chairs in health services is becoming a lot more frequent around nurses. Mm. They're particularly strong at Victoria, I know that. Um, but that's a part of our mm. role, is to mm. facilitate clinicians to start mm. doing that, or uh, supporting them in whatever way they need. It doesn't mm. mean that every, every clinician has to go out and do research, that's not what it's about. It's about participating mm. in something. I think you're right. I think one of the challenges is that there's a lot of nurse academics out there who are doing some really great work, but there's also a lot of them who don't necessarily understand nursing in primary care. Um, I, I'm astounded by the number of times I get a phone call going, you're an expert nurse practitioner, aren't you? And I go like, no, <laughs> I know one. <laughs> but the, because I, you know, like I've been working in the field of practice nursing for a really long time, but I know nothing more about nurse practitioners than any other nurse. It's not, I mean, I've done a few bits and pieces in that area, but it's not my thing. But people clearly clearly get practice nurse, nurse practitioner quite confused and yeah, so it's, I think that's the challenge is trying to locate someone. Maxie's probably a really good example. So I mean, I guess there's a couple of ways. I mean, one way is to be, to a be looking out for projects that are in your area. Like Catherine has spent months trying to find nurses to do this hypertension stuff, and it, and essentially it's not a lot more than you're already doing. It's just about having a structured way of doing it, um, and trying to and looking for opportunities like that. And I mean, I know we're doing some other work in in, in palliative care, in advanced care planning, um, COPD, and a range of different. So have a look for those opportunities to be engaged with those. I guess the other thing is that we've always got students coming to us going, oh, I'd like to do something in primary care, but I don't know what. So if you've got this burning project, but mm. you really don't want to do it, yeah. then often there are students around the place who want a project, but are not necessarily connected to a clinical area. And 
perhaps yeah. that's a way of getting something done that you can't do or don't have the capacity or time to do, but it gives the student a project, it gets the piece of research done and we all are winners. So we might just keep moving. The next tip was about um, making sure that you've got, your research has got a clear plan. And I think it's really important, often we, we sort of set out to do some piece of research and we don't have a really clear plan about what that's going to look like or where it's going to go. And a part of this is that we really need to make sure if we're spending a whole lot of time collecting data to provide evidence about something, that it's got to be rigorous. Because if we put a survey out and the question's wrong or the question's not collecting the right kind of data, we can't analyse the data effectively and it's not meaningful. So often you see sort of surveys come out and the, the, the questions are not well thought through, they're not using validated scales, they're not they're collecting age as a, um, a variable that's, uh, that's in, a, in a bracket because people don't want to put the number down, but that makes a complete difference to the way you analyse it. So it's got to be collected in a rigorous way. So if you're trying to collect data, again, make sure you've got someone on the team who actually has some skills around data collection and analysis because it's too late to find out when you get to the end that, oh my God, I've just collected all this stuff, but in actual fact, I needed something else. And having a really good plan and a really clear idea of where you're going to go with a project is really important to help you to garner resources because no one's going to give you money for a project if you haven't got a clear plan, clear aims, a clear way of data collection and a plan of something to do with it at the end. And it'll be very hard to disseminate as well, it can be, in appropriate places, yeah. Mm. Let's keep going through. Okay, so the next one. Research takes time, energy and skill to complete. <laughs> Unfortunately, good research doesn't happen overnight. <laughs> um, yeah. But it does happen. <laughs> so it, 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 it does require a significant investment of time. A lot of people come to us asking about, um, about doing research um, studies and are kind of quite shocked when they realise a PhD takes three years full time to complete. And by full time, I mean three hours. Uh, three years when you're working sort of 30 to 40 hours a week on this project. And, and it really does take that long. <laughs> if you don't believe me, go and chat to the students because I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, it does take considerable time, energy and skill. So if you're going to embark on doing a research project, you really need to be in a space where you've got that time, energy and skill, or if not, be working in a place where you can get some resources to allow you to employ people to help you to do that type of work. Um, but research is a very step-by-step -step process, so if you take each step at a time and, and keep progressing through, you are going to get there in the end. I think this is Catherine's probably big, biggest lesson that she's learnt, is that you need to engage supporters to help you with the conduct of the study. Um, chocolate, chocolate and more chocolate has been what I've found to be successful, but clearly we've gone past chocolate, particularly in the primary care space. Everyone is out there pitching their research ideas. I know Catherine came back one day and she said she'd just visited a practice and she was number nine yeah. in that week who'd gone there to ask them to do some study. So she was actually very lucky and she clearly must have talked well because she actually got her study through in that particular practice. Easy to do. Easy to find out what my research project is doing because that's going forward and I took, I took that with me and thought, well, you know what, as researchers we might need to get better at putting things mm -hmm. But I guess, I guess as researchers, it would be great for us to know that we've got nurses who are sitting there and also pitching for our projects as well because it's really, really important if we try to advance the nursing agenda that we're all sticking on the same page and we're all supporting each other. And I think those relationships do need to be nurtured. I mean, I, where I work, I've got most of the clientele is in an, an Indigenous population. So that it takes time. You know, it took me six months to even get into that kind of community. I think that's really an important mm. point. And the last tip we've got around um, research generation is that the research isn't finished until it's shared. We come to these conferences every year and we hear these really great stories of wonderful things that are happening around the country. 
But unless you're here, you don't hear the story. And there's so much really good work happening, but we need to be getting it out there. Our, our, our dietetics colleagues, our general practitioner colleagues are certainly getting their stuff out in the peer-reviewed literature. It's out there, it's being seen, it's being looked at. We can then use those articles to put, to put in the more newsy kind of newsletters and to get in the, in the, in the mainstream media, but it's really important to be able to get, it, get our message out there and making sure that it's heard. Um, and I guess some of the questions we had before, well, if I've got this great idea, I've got this study, but I don't know what to do with it, I don't know how to publish it, have a look around APNA. There's certainly a whole bunch of people sitting in this room who've, who've got a record of publication who will be more than happy to work with people and help them to do things like that. I'm just mindful of time, so we're just hurrying fairly quickly yeah. through. In terms of opportunities for research training, there's certainly opportunities around short courses. I know, oh, did I not ask you for permission, guys? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you gave me permission last time. Um, <laughs> so um, certainly short courses around the place. The Bachelor of Nursing Honours course it sounds a little bit bizarre because most of you, I'm sure, have got a bachelor's degree or, or equivalent and have been nurses for some time and, and maybe even have a master's. But I guess what the BN Honours offers you is it gives you a one-year full-time or two-year part-time taste of doing research. And it's a very small project in most universities, but it's a very small contained project. So you get a feel for what it's like and, and a, I guess a bit of a heads up of what the research process is and how it might look. UNE's got scholarships for the Honours program, but I've... Let you know. <laughs> 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 sharing that. <laughs> um, and masters of philosophy, masters of research, or PhD are clearly much much larger programs that involve significantly longer periods of study and much bigger projects. At Wollongong, we've been successful in having uh, I don't know one, two, five. I'm thinking off the top of my head. Students have actually had full time scholarships to do their PhDs in the primary care space in the last five years, which I'm really proud of because I don't know that there's another nursing school that's achieved that many, in, particularly in a particular dis, like area, especially area. So that's, that's been great for us to be able to have that support. And I know those students have worked incredibly hard to, to get through their PhD in three years with not very much money. So given that we're sort of running out of time, we're just going to um, very quickly just skip through to some of the tips we had around um, using evidence in your practice. Um, so, you know, I guess, and ju moves jumping in at any time, I think it's really important and to become really close friends with li your librarian as well, particularly when you're, you're actually looking for research and librarians are in all the healthcare services that I'm aware of. Um, I think to take away from this, this slide is if you are time poor, look for the collated evidence, look for a systematic review, look for scoping reviews and up-to-date ones and that, sh that would be able to provide you with an overview of what you're actually looking at. I'll just skip. Yeah. Um, it, sometimes it can be really difficult to know um, whether what you're reading is good or not good. It's really hard to critique that evidence. These days there's so many... Um, checklists that that are you know the Joanna Biggs got Briggs has got one for pretty much every study, and it tells you what questions to ask of that evidence. Okay, and then it will come up. Some sometimes I come up with a score, and it will say, is this good or is this bad? Okay, so that's that's just a, a I guess a a trick to evaluating evidence, I suppose. Um, and, you know, certainly with our students, that we get them to use those checklists as a guide as well. Um, and I think here, make it fun, you know, talk to other clinicians. We're not going to be able to, you know, expand our evidence-based practice if we're not collaborating and we're not talking to each other. Um, many, many moons ago, I think we had a journal club, didn't we, as students? Very long time ago. Off the yeah, <laughs> um, and it's just, we did, I mean, we would we'll look at articles, we'll talk about our research projects, it was just a way to collaborate. I know there's a lot of, um, both Liz and I students are having great conversations on Twitter about their research, which I think is fantastic. So it's just different ways to engage. And I think like um, there's a lot of Facebook groups around at the moment, of yeah. healthcare nurses, so, um, Hunter New England have got one, um, GP Southern... Yep. So there's, there's certainly a range of them around there. So looking at those proper sites are really helpful too. Yes. 
Yeah. So I guess just in summary, because I know we've really run out of time, is we, mm. how do we know what works and what doesn't if we don't ask the questions and we don't try and find some kind of answer? And I think it's really important as nurses, we need to take the lead in crafting our story because if we don't, mm. other professions are going to start crafting yeah. it for us. And I guess if there's nothing else you take home from this, not all nurses need to do their own research. But what all nurses need to do is they need to use research in their practice and they also need to facilitate research to be undertaken. So by helping out others, by engaging in research, by being a participant. And certainly if there's anyone who's got, wants to have more conversations, Leah and I are certainly happy to have conversations with you after this. Thank you. Thank you.